Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue where we left off yesterday. I was not able to to move on. There was just too many things or threads that we would have had to, to follow. So we're going to pick up from there. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for the things that you show us from your word and the effect that they have upon our Christian walk, upon our life. And uh, we're thankful for your spirit speaking to our hearts and the conviction and power that it brings. We pray for this study, Lord, that as we open your word together, that your Holy Spirit can be our teacher. We ask, Lord, that the things that we study, that they can be useful uh, in reaching others with the gospel. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so I don't know how many people spent a bit of time trying to um, understand the history of the 1260s. So, so a lot of information. I read a little bit about Charlemagne and uh, Pius VI, kind of looking towards the end of the 1260s. I didn't have time to look into um, the Crusades at all. But I can give you just sort of a, a general overview of what what happens in this period. And this is very, very general. I'm just going to go to this diagram we have here. So we all know the Pope, he becomes uh, the, the time of papal supremacy begins in the 6th century, as Ellen White says in The Great Controversy. Chapter three, uh, where she deals with Second Thessalonians. And we know Second Thessalonians is addressing the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate, that 30 year period in there. And, and we know that we have, um, Justinian's, you know, decree and all those different things that happen. There's, there's a, a Sunday law in 538 and a, might have it in my notes. I can't remember it now specifically what it was. Should be able to remember these things, but I don't always. Um, and then we, we started looking at, well, what about Charlemagne? You know, you know, he becomes a, at the beginning of the ninth century. He, we now have an empire, an emperor in Western Rome. Now we have, of course, in Eastern Rome, in Constantinople, and and they become in conflict to some degree, and I'm not sure all of the different conflicts that occur, but it does create a conflict. Now, I don't know what people know about the Crusades. I know a little bit, but not very much. I know they go on for quite a while, and there's, you know, basically the idea is that Islam has taken over Jerusalem, and the Catholics want Jerusalem uh, to be controlled by Christians. And so there's going to be these crusades that occur. And they, they do precede, um, 1299. So the rise of Othman, right? So the Ottoman Empire, which begins July 27th in 1299, uh, obviously the beginning of, uh, the first woe, 150 years. And then we have the second woe. And that's going to be Constantine. So what I was, Constantine the 11th. So what I was thinking, and I want some input in this. Do we look at um, Eastern Rome, even though that this mostly addresses the West, Western, um, like the Roman Catholic Church? Because we always just think about, well, Pope Pius, he's the, the Pope, right? It's the Catholic Church, the, the Roman Catholic Church, not the the, you know, the other Christian churches that are similar. Um, do we address the East? Do we address Islam? Uh, you know, there's so many different way marks if we start to look at all of these different um, lines. I don't know. Any, any thoughts on this? Did anybody do any thinking about this before we proceed further? Anybody think about this since yesterday morning? I've spent a little bit of time, but I'm I, I'm looking at 
so much of what we've got here regarding this with Clovis in 508 and then the 30 years to 538 yeah. and how this is kind of a, again, a beginning. I mean, I recognize that there have been studies that are showing that 30-year period as being a preparatory time, much as when Christ was being prepared for his ministry. Right. So, now, yeah. So if we take the line from the time of Christ, right. You know, the time of the end is going to be uh, the birth of John the Baptist, right? Okay. Right. And then you're going to have uh, the birth of Christ. And then you're going to have his baptism and his crucifixion, right? There's different ways people have looked at that line. But normally we put the cross as the arrival of the second angel's message. Right. So, so, you know, and that's why here I've been trying to say, well, how do we, how do we take this 30 years? How do we mark these way marks? However, it's, it's done. I think once we're done, we'll see that things fall into place rather nicely. But part of the problem is we're not particularly certain about the period of darkness, what exactly it is. I mean, we know it probably has something to do with the end of paganism, pagan Rome, and then we have uh, the rise of papal Rome. And the question is, how do we mark that? And then, and then we're going to have trouble again with the second angel because there's lots of different things that we can address. What we've tried to address so far, at least with marking the events, is we're taking the events mentioned in Daniel chapter 11. But some of them are fairly vague. So, I don't know, if we go back there again, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit, but I don't have an answer to it yet. So obviously we have uh, the dramatic inv invasions in verse 30, right? So um, that's the ships of Kitten. And, you know, we mark 410 for the start of that um, because that's going to be when uh, he returns, he, he shall be grieved in return. And then he's going to have indignation against the daily or against, pardon me, against the, the Holy Covenant, right? And, and that's going to be ending, you know, ending the daily and setting up the abomination of desolation. That's what's going to be happening in the next verse. And then we had, so shall he do. He, pagan Rome, shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So that's what happens in that period, in that 30 year period. We're going to, or even before that. We start to see this mixing of uh, Christianity and paganism, right? So that's well described in Great Controversy, Chapter 3. And then the arms, military might of Clo Clovis of the French, and he's baptized on December 25th, 508. We're using that as a way mark. She'll stand on his part, that is, on behalf of papal Rome. They shall pollute the sanctuary strength, that's paganism and take away the daily, right? So remove paganism. So the sanctuary of paganism and paganism is moved out of the way. It's been hindering uh, papalism. And they, so then they're going to place the abomination that make it desolate, right? So this has to do with the power over church and state and conscience. So we mark 538. And then we had, so those are all clear, but I mean, as far as waymarks, as far as events, we've marked them, how we label them, that's still another story. And then such as do wickedly against the covenant. So we had some discussion as to what that might be. Um, but he shall corrupt by flattery. So there's going to be people who do wickedly against the covenant. And the papacy is going to corrupt these people by flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do. So I had a question, you know, could we take this, um, such as do wickedly against the covenant, uh, have to do with Islam's attack upon Christianity? Or is this just the papacy's attack against true Christians? 
So we, we need to decide that. I think I would fall more on the papacy okay. and attack than I would with this with Islam. Okay, so we're going to say that this is, so those and such as do wickedly against the covenant, we're going to say that that is, um, now, swearing again had, you know, those who turn against the gospel, uh, some other stuff, but I, I, you know, I have those who turn against the gospel through recantation, those who reject the gospel, are are the ones that do wickedly against the covenant. So these would be apostates. And and then the papacy is going to corrupt by flatteries, these apostates. So that, that does make sense. I, I think we can read that. Now, we, we have to figure out what these flatteries are. Now, and, and I think that's why I was looking at... Um, uh, Charlemagne, because, I mean, what we end up having in this period, if we, we think about this period of papal persecution, well, persecution grows and develops in this history. It's not like in 538, all of a sudden they're, you know, uh, killing all the, all the true Christians. I mean, they have the power to do this. They start to exercise a power, at least legally, they put in place a power that they then are later going to use. And, and I don't know enough about this history. That is, this is, there's so many things going on at this period of time. And, and often when you read the history books, I mean, they're going to be picking things. I mean, I've read some histories of this period and then I'd read another history and it's almost like I was reading two different histories just because Depends on the focus of the historian, what, what he's really focusing upon. Some will talk a lot about, uh, you know, the actions of the Catholic Church. Uh, some will look at more, like, there's lots of different countries. Um, you know, some will fo- fo- focus more on, you know, what's happening in the West, some in the East. And so, you know, to study this history, I mean, this would take a long time, you know, to, to understand all of this history. For each of us, you know, studying hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, right? So we don't know much. We know what's here, though, what's here in Daniel chapter 11, and that can help us pick out these events. But corrupting by flatteries, I mean, we have this really general idea, flatter with prospects of position and material gain. But we don't have some specifics, like, how do I mark that down as an event? So that's why I sh- chose Charlemagne. And Charlemagne also has the advantage of having a symbolic date attached to him. So, so I was thinking, and, and I don't think this is right, but I just wanted to. So we know we got Charlemagne, and then I'm going to put here. So just sh- sh- sharing the screen here. Change that. So I got. Uh, Count Giovanni Angelo Braschi. He, he's going to be born on December 25th, 1717. Anybody know who he is? He was a pope, right? Yeah, he's, he's Pope Pius VI. Okay. And we know that he's going to be made pope on February 15th, 1775. And then he's going to be taken captive on February 15th, 1798, which which I thought was very interesting. Also, the fact that William Miller is going to be born in 1782. He's going to be born seven years after Pope Pius uh, becomes the Pope, right, to the day. This period of time here is, is 23 years from 1775 to 1798. So he's Pope for 23 years before he's taken captive. And then we know, of course, he's going to die August 29th in 1799. So... But as far as prophetic waymarks, I think his his being captured is is the most relevant as far as marking the time of the end in 1798. So with this idea, what what I've done is I've taken now Charlemagne's not a pope, but he is an emperor, and we have the December 25th date. And then I said, well, that's going to be we're going to have this at the end. Right, we're going to have uh, Pope Pius the sixth being taken captive, and maybe this is just part of Pope Pius's own personal line. Maybe we shouldn't 
put these events here. But any discussion about this idea? I, I, I don't think it's the correct idea, but any discussion on this? Anybody like what's here? Anybody not like it? It presents an interesting questions. I mean, for this to be the empowerment of the second angel's message of Pius the sixth being installed as Pope, that's I'm I'm just I, I'm trying to wrap my head around how that's working. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. But but these are these are dates that we have. Now we right. have other dates. Now the other thing is we also have Constantine the eleventh. Right. He's going to be the last uh, emperor. So instead of dealing with these popes, I could have dealt with him. And so now we did look at him a little bit near the end of the study yesterday. But I mean, this this is placing, you know, light coming quite a bit earlier than what we we have looked at historically. I don't know what you mean. In in the past, haven't we generally looked at 1798 as having kind of the beginning of when light was coming to those after an extended period of darkness? Yeah. But what we're looking at here is papal Rome. Right. So this, so this is, you know, we did pagan Rome. Now we're doing papal Rome. And so we're looking at the start of Papal Rome and the end of Papal Rome, right? So 1798 obviously is the time of the end, but here we're marking it as the third message arriving at this point, right? So it, it's it's marking the, near the end of a line, and and even the light that comes here is not you know it's not necessarily like it's not the gospel message. I mean this is is addressing a particular type of darkness. And we could say it, it, for us, it would be an understanding of history that would be being marked. So, you know, when we look at the verses themselves, my, my inclination would be to take what's in Daniel chapter 11 and try to find the events that match that. So, again, I'm going to switch back to document so we would just have to say what event you know when it says and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries so so i'm saying well who's being corrupted by flatteries it's it's those that turn against the is it those that turn against the gospel through recantation you know or maybe those that are deceived I mean, they do wickedly against the Holy Covenant or against the covenant. Here's just using the word covenant. And, and particularly, what does that mean? If they're going to do wickedly against the covenant, what, what is it that we would mark? Now, one of the things that I look at is we have that word wickedly against, such as do wickedly against, as 7561. And so I look at that as a symbol of the Sunday law because 7651 is the number that's seven times. So can we, is there anything that we can can take from this as far as marking this as an event? I mean, we already have, uh, you know, the Sunday law symbol. So we know that the third council of, of Orleans in 538, Orleans is named after Aurelian. He dedicated the temple of Sol Invictus, December 25th, 274 AD. It's 264 years prior to 538. So Stephen gave us that information. So we can see that this typifies a Sunday law. So we look at the Third Council of Orleans. Maybe maybe we mark that event as being what's being talked about. They that do wickedly against uh, the covenant. Maybe it's it has to do with that event. So those that... Because um, I don't know if I'm really happy with those that turn against the gospel through recantation. I don't think it's it's apostates necessarily, people who were Christians. So the question is, who does wickedly against the covenant? And that would have to be those that bring in the Sunday law. So we could say 
um, you know, if we put here Sunday law in 538, then it says he shall corrupt by flatteries. So can we say that when people bring in a Sunday law, now these are, these are governments to some degree, right? I mean, it's uh, this uh, May 7th, 538. So I'm just going to look at this here a bit more. So the Third Council of Orléans, the Third Council of National Stature, or Third Council of Orléans, was a synod of the Catholic bishops of France. So this is a Catholic, this is a synod, Catholic bishops. It opened around the 7th of May, 538, and was presided over by Luc, Archbishop of Lyon. Uh, it established mainly Sunday as the day of the Lord, Prohibition of field work on Sundays, prohibition of clerics practicing usury, prohibition of the conjuring of priests as a critic of their bishop. Uh, the bishop must redeem a Christian slave in the service of a Jew if he takes refuge in the church. While the constitutions of the lower Roman Empire demanded to return them to their master without further guarantees. So that's that's all we have here just in Wikipedia. <clears throat> So it establishes Sunday as the day of the Lord and this prohibition of field work on Sundays. Any thoughts on this? Okay, I'm just going to go over here, put this in here. So we can do this before May 7th. So May 7th, obviously, is Julian calendar, and that's going to be the 21st of Nisan on the biblical calendar. We got 16.6 here, which represents FFA. I don't know. So, you know, maybe we just put that, that date there. I'm just going to say there's a Sunday law here in 538. So we have a Sunday law. Now, we have the popes, and we have the popes supported by the military of France. So they're, they're supported by the state. Now, if we look at Charlemagne, then, is there any way that we can establish that as a way mark, whether it's the second angel arriving or some other way. Because the significance of Charlemagne is you have uh, the state submitting to the church. Okay, I'm just going to read a little bit here dealing with the coronation of Charlemagne. Um, 799, after Pope Leo III was abused by Romans who tried to put out his eyes and tear out his tongue. I'm not sure why they were doing that. He escaped and fled to Charlemagne at Paderborn. Charlemagne, advised by scholar, I can never pronounce this guy's name. I know I'm Alcuin, it's not pronounced like that, of York, traveled to Rome on November 800 and held a council on December 1st. On December 23rd, Leo, Leo swore an oath of innocence. Hmm. At Mass on Christmas Day, December 25th, when Charlemagne knelt at the altar to pray, the Pope crowned him. Imperator Romanorum, Romanorum, Emperor of the Romans in St. Peter's Basilica. In so doing, the Pope effectually, effectively nullified the legitimacy of Empress Irene of Constantinople. So I guess in the East we have an Empress. As historian James Bryce writes, when Odiacer compelled the abdication of Romulus Augustulus, he did not abolish the Western Empire as a separate power, but caused it to be reunited with or sink into the Eastern, so that from that time there was a single undivided Roman Empire. Pope Leo III and Charlemagne, like their predecessors, held the Roman Empire to be one and indivisible, and proposed by the coronation of Charlemagne not to proclaim a severance of the East and West. So Charlemagne's coronation as emperor, though intended to represent the continuation of the unbroken line of emperors from Augustus to Constantine VI, the effect of setting up two separate and often opposing empires and two separate claims to imperial authority for centuries to come, the emperors of both West and East could make competing claims of sovereignty over the whole. Okay, so, so that would be the issue there. Does that issue click in any way with what we're understanding about these lines? So if we look at this line, 
This line is about the, the first the fall of pagan Rome, right? Now, pagan Rome, um, you know, has in a sense be, been divided east and west, though for the most part, it's still one empire, even though we talk about the Eastern Roman Empire because the capital has moved to Constantinople. The emperor in the east does not believe that he does not have control over the entire empire. I mean, he might not have practical control over what's happening necessarily, but he believes he has control, right? That that is his territory. And there isn't another emperor until Charlemagne that that challenges that. So that's one thought. And then we have to we have to say, well, how, what does that have to do with with the papacy? Um, or is this is this about the papacy per se? I mean, we know that it's the time of papal supremacy, but is it about how their supremacy uh, rise, rises, how it comes to be at like the beginning, and also the end of that? And so there, there has to be something that connects. There has to be a thread that ties these all together. So one is we have December 25th as a symbol of the Sunday law. So you know, we have December 25th. Clovis, we have the Sunday Law, which is in that case May 7th, 538. We have Charlemagne, uh, crowned emperor on December 25th, 800. And then we have uh, the last uh, pope of that 1260 year period, uh, Pius VI being born on December 25th, 1717. And then the, him becoming the pope and his captivity both on February 15th. 23 years apart. So any thoughts on this? I know this is tough. Anything we can say about this? Why why are we starting the darkness in 410? Well, because we believe that the darkness has to do with the fall of pagan Rome. So that's going to be the ships of Kitten. That's why we're using 410. And the response to the ships of Kitten. So we're saying that the that's the darkness. The darkness now is pagan Rome is falling. That that's what we chose. So so there's a darkness. So the response to that is the rise of papal Rome, and and so we're using the time of the end, which is the end of pagan Rome in 476. So the fall of Western Rome in 476 uh, to mark the time of the end. Because it's the time of the end of Western Rome. And then we're going to have um, 32 years before Clovis' baptism, and then another 30 years until the setting up of the abomination of desolation. So, so the question was, you know, what is the darkness? Does that make any sense at all? Well, I'm, I'm looking at this for a different reason. Okay. Um, at this point, we have this, we have 410, but is is that the the better point to use i mean the o- the only reason i'm asking is that i'm looking at a time period that's that comes somewhat close in in the studies that we've done on the line of christ we have accepted that 27 was the year in which he was baptized yeah we've also looked that there is there is a different symbol that we we have considered in the past in other studies of 391 mm-hmm. from 27 391 years would bring us to 418 okay now 418 depending on how you're counting would generally look at being about 8 years 7 slash 8 years after 410 is that possible i mean there's there's a time from 27 and adding 391 okay okay i see what you're doing so you want to have 418 and what what's on 4 418 well i'm just i'm just starting to look at this i'm looking at the numbers first and then looking for historical applications after this okay well i don't know if i would do that so okay. lots of reasons. Um, so we, we already do have like different applications of 391. But um, 
I don't know if that that makes any sense here because we're not we're not connecting this in that way. Like we have the 30 years, right? That 30 years, is, this is a counterfeit line. We know the papacy is a counterfeit and of Christ. So that's why the 30 years and then the papacy begins, right? And we mark 538 as the cross, not as the baptism, right? So there's 30 years to Christ's baptism, three and a half years more uh, to the cross. But here we just have the 30 years as a preparatory period. So I don't know how, why we would connect it to 27 BC. I didn't say BC. AD, I mean 27 AD. Um, I don't see the significance of that. Like there's no reason to connect it in that way. Like we have symbols that, that are there, but I, I don't think a span of time. Plus we, we do have an event in Daniel chapter 11. That's the ships of Kitten. We definitely can't put that in 418, right? So we're just saying we have a way mark. It's in Daniel chapter 11, verse 30. That is where we're starting this line. We're starting it with a period of darkness. I mean, we have lots of other events. You know, we have, you know, the move, remove the movement of the capital from Rome to Constantinople in 330. And then we could say, well, you know, we could have started there. Because, you know, obviously this line appears to be addressing this division of the empire, especially if we start looking at, at Charlemagne as part of this line. But the period of darkness, it, it's not, I mean, we just have to have some idea of what the darkness is. This particular date's not super important here. I mean, we do have the 66 years there to the time of the end. But the idea is, what is the darkness? And the darkness has to do with the fact that Pagan Rome has fallen, right? Western Rome. And, and now we have in its place, because the daily has been taken out of the way, uh, that's going to happen in a period of time. And it's going to be when Clovis is baptized in, on December 25th in 508, that we now have the daily taken away. And so first step is first Rome has to fall. So the fall of Western Rome, 476, is a date that we have. Clovis being baptized is a date that we have. The Sunday Law, May 7th and 538, is the date that we have. And are those the first angel's message? If they are, what is that message? And we can say, well, the increase of knowledge has to do with, uh, um, you know, the different battles with the Germanic, uh, um, with the different kingdoms uh, that are going on in that time. You know, there's just, there's from the fall of Western Rome to Clovis, there is this period of time in which lots is happening, right? So those would be represented by the 10 kingdoms basically being developed. And then you have Clovis, he's the king of the Franks, and he's going to, become converted he's supporting the papacy and then 30 years later uh justinians uh, is going to basically be setting up uh, the papacy through justinians uh decree or whatever it is okay so so that's why we have that there so the question is are those three way marks can we say that that is a response to the darkness would those be the events? And, and I pretty much am convinced that those are the events. That is, all of them are being marked in Daniel chapter 11. And so to me, the first angel's message is pretty clear. Exactly where you want to start the darkness, I don't think it matters. We just need to know what the darkness is. And it's, it's the events that lead to the fall of Western Rome. So when Western, Western Rome falls, that's the time of the end in where now we're going to see that the papacy is going to rise. Does that make sense to anybody how I'm looking at this? Because I don't, I don't know if people are understanding what I'm doing. Here again, I'm having to consider what you're saying because I have not thought in that, in that type of a line. Okay. Yeah. And all I'm doing is I'm taking what's in Daniel chapter 11 and putting it on a line. And of having to decide what it, what are the events 
that we that we have in Daniel 11, how can we mark them? I think the first three are really clear. I mean, the taking up away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation, that's definitely there in the text. The ships of Kittim. So, you know, that's what we really have here. So we have the ships of Kittim, which lead to the fall of Western Rome. We have the taking away of the daily, and we have the setting up of the abomination of desolation. That is the first angel's message in this line that's you know, symbolized by that first message, which is arrives, is formalized, and then is empowered. And these all make sense. So I don't have problems with that first part of this line. And then, and then we have the second angel's message. So the question is, what is that? So we, we have a Sunday law, and that's, that's made by bishops. So, I mean, it's, it's more a religious law. Now, they do have the power of the state, but here they're going to be controlling of the power of the state when they make Charle when the Pope makes Charlemagne the emperor of the Western Roman Empire, believing to be, you know, the emperor of the entire Roman Empire, but in practical terms, it's not really the case. So we know the Eastern Church still exists in Constantinople. <clears throat> now, so we, we've talked about different things. We considered Islam putting it in here. I don't think we are. I don't think we're going to be putting uh, Othman in here in 1299 as a waymark. Now, we put Pope Pius VI, his birth, and his becoming Pope in there. But that might be more just part of his personal life. Now, we do have... Constantine the 11th. But again, he's, he's an Eastern Roman emperor. Now, Eastern Rome falling is that important in this context? I mean, we, we generally don't study much about the Eastern Roman Empire. So the Byzantine Empire. So it's a continuation of the Roman Empire centered in Constantinople during late antiquity, antiquity in the Middle Ages. So the eastern half of the empire survived the conditions that caused the fall of the West in the 5th century and continued to exist until the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire in 15 or 1453. So we know Constantine the 11th is going to be the last emperor, right? In 1449, he becomes the emperor of Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. And four years later, Constantinople was going to fall. Uh, during most of its existence, the empire remained the most powerful economic, cultural, and military force in the Mediterranean world. The term Byzantine Empire was only coined following the empire's demise. Its citizens referred to the, the polity as the Roman Empire and to themselves as Romans. Due to the imperial seats move from Rome to Byzantinium, the adoption of state Christianity and the predominance of Greek instead of Latin, modern historians continue to make a distinction between the earlier Roman Empire and the later Byzantine Empire. During the earlier Pax Romana period, that's the Roman peace, the western parts of the empire became increasingly Latinized, while the eastern parts largely retained their pre-existing Hellenistic culture. This created a dichotomy between the Greek East and Latin West. These cultural spheres continued to diverge after Constantine I moved the capital to Constantinople and legalized Christianity. Under Theodosius, Christianity became the state religion and other religions, religious practices were prescribed. Greek gradually replaced Latin for official use as Latin fell into disuse. Yeah, so there's a lot of history, and some of this I know a little bit. Um, the empire was dissolved in, in 1204, following the sack of Constantinople by Latin armies at the end of the Fourth Crusade. Its former territories were then divided into competing Greek and Latin realms. Despite the eventual recovery of Constantinople in 1261, and I usually have 1260, but anyway, uh, the reconstituted empire would... Um, wield only regional power during its final two centuries of existence. Its remaining territories were progressively annexed by the Ottomans in perennial wars fought through the 14th and 15th centuries. The fall of Constantinople 
to the Ottomans in 1453, ultimately brought the empire to an end. Many refugees who had fled the city after its capture settled in Italy and throughout Europe, helping to ignite the Renaissance. Okay, so Constantine the Eleventh being the last one. I don't know. Do we do we address the Eastern Roman Empire? I mean, Charlemagne's rise, he would be challenging the authority of the empress at that time in the East. Anybody with any ideas on this, what we, what we could do? Now, there's, the interesting thing there is we do see that, that actually Constantinople falls to, to the Western Roman Empire briefly, right? The Catholic Church is actually going to con- conquer Constantinople, which, so they call that the sack of Constantinople. And then, uh, my understanding is it's going to be in 620. They say here 621, but, um, or not 621, 1261. And I say it's 1260 that, that they end up, um, I did some, you know, research in this back, you know, 2018, 2019. Yeah. The siege of Constantinople in 1260. Okay. That's what happened. So they, they failed to, to take over. So it's a failed siege. What was it about that siege? Yeah. So in 1261, they're going to eventually take o- take it over. But there's this siege in 1260, and I did some research on it before, um, but that was a long time ago. Anyway, there was some significance regarding that siege that I don't remember. I thought I think it had something to do with the biblical dates or the dates in that siege. So it's going to be then to see an army that tries to capture Constantinople from the Latins, from the Latin Empire. Okay, so I guess that's strange. Yeah. See, I don't know enough about this history. Yeah, in 1261. Yeah, so the Paleologos dynasty, that's, of course, Constantine the Eleventh is Dracosi's Pale- Paleologos. Con- right, so that's his his family name or part of his dynasty. Right. So, so it's not going to be until 1453 that it's, it's actually going to fall to the Ottoman Turks, to the Ottoman Empire. So there's, so there's a lot of history in there that we're, we're not particularly familiar with as Westerners. We don't really study the Eastern Roman Empire because we're more affected by the Western Roman Empire. So the question is, should, is, is there anything in Daniel chapter 11 that can address that? So I'm, I'm using Daniel chapter 11 as where we're getting our information. So we know the people that do know their God shall be strong and do, right? So we know that there's a preaching of the gospel there. I mean, I don't know how we mark that as a way mark. We know they that understand among the people shall instruct many that they shall fall by the sword. So obviously we know that's the persecution that's going to occur and by flame, by captivity and by spoil. So there's four, four of them is sword, flame, captivity, spoil. And then we have the many days. So the many days we just attach to the 1260 years and then they shall fall, but they shall be halted or helped with a little help. Now, should we put in there something to do with the United States being the land of the free? You know, we could, you know, the question is what, what leads to the fall of, of papal Rome? I mean, maybe, maybe it has something to do with what happens in the United States. I mean, we know obviously France is going to take him captive. How do we connect that history at all? Do we connect it at all? Any thoughts? You guys got to help me a bit here. Cause, I mean, do we put the Mayflower in here? Under what application would we put the Mayflower in here? That is the, the, the earth helps the woman. But does that equate to something having to do with the first angel or second angel? Well, that's the second angel. That would be. So that's, that's what we would have to decide, whether we have Charlemagne and all this stuff in there, or whether we, we look at 
because what what it says is there's going to be this persecution for 1260 years, but the earth is going to help the woman. So do we focus upon that as Waymarks, as the second angel? Now, we do have a date there, which we should know, November 9th, uh, 1620. They're going to cite uh, land, Cape Cod. Do we put that as the arrival of the second angel? Do we take things from American history as addressing uh, this help? So we're looking at what's here. This is what's given us. So the earth helps the woman, right? So that is from Revelation chapter 12. And, And we're making that parallel here. During this period of 1260 years, now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. And then it says, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So again, we have flatteries being mentioned. Some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, purge them, make them white. So that brings us to 1798. So if we, we just forget about Charlemagne here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm just gonna duplicate this slide here. So we could look at the Mayflower and the date we have. November 9th, 1620. But the nice thing about that date is it has the same digits as the 1260 in it. Um, and then it also has November 9th. So, so if this, if this is the second angel, how does this lead then to the fall of the papacy? Would we mark events in American history? Okay. Here again, a different application of numbers. Okay. It's interesting because you, in, in noting this from history, November 9th of 1620 is the arrival, right? Yeah, that's when they, they see Cape Cod. Okay. But April 5th of the following year, 5th of the fourth month, is when the Mayflower returns to England. Okay, but then if you're if you're also looking at this from 1620 to 1798, you have yeah. 178 years, mm-hmm. the digits of 187. Yeah, coming to the time when the Pope is taken captive. Yeah, and and so what do you have there that's interesting? So, so you're saying we have um, April 5th. Yes. 1621. Um, now it's, so what happens on that date? The Mayflower sets sail for a return trip to England. Okay, so it begins to set sail. Right. Okay. So, you know, if you looked at Millerite history, we know that um, the second angel arrives the first day of the first month, which, um, we, we have as a symbol as being uh, connected to 9-11 and 11-9, right? All right. Okay. Second angel arrives at 9-11. Also, we can attach November 9th to that symbol of 9-11, and that's the second angel arriving. The second angel's formalized on the fifth day of the fourth month at Boston, right? Right. So here we have this here. Now, if we're going to, if we're going to say that this is the Mayflower, this is again the Mayflower, but it's just leaving. So this is all about the earth helping the woman. What would we put at the second angel empowered then? So we're just saying this is all about the earth helping the woman. Do we put like 1776 in there? I don't know yet. I'm looking at something else with this. Okay. I mean, cause if we put in, you know, July 4th, 1776, you know, you got the United States, um, the Declaration of Independence, and then you got 22 years to the Pope being captive. Repeat why you got April, April 5th, 1621. Well, that's when the Mayflower leaves. That's when it goes back to England. Okay. Now, I don't, I don't know the whole story of all that, so. I assume they're going back. For what reason? Why are they going back? 
I, I mean, would, I would believe for other provisions. Yeah. So or to bring other settlers. Yeah, I think would bring other people there. So I mean, the earth helping the woman. We we always mark the pilgrims who came on the Mayflower. Wouldn't it also be that they might be taking stuff back, like the you know, like they could have gotten like gold or something other like that while it was there, some kind of treasure that they might have found while it was there and taking it back to. Well, while that's possible, I mean, a lot of a lot of the reason for the Mayflower coming was for religious freedom. Right, I understand that. I just thought maybe there was. You know, that they could be just taking stuff back to show them that their trip was not was not made void or something other that they could they could do commerce as well. I didn't. Yeah, I don't think so. But um, now there's a question about 1773. So 25 years of the shortening of the 1260. I'm, I'm not sure about the question do we, that we should mark 1773 as some event in 1773 rather than 1776. Is that what you're asking, Daniel? Okay, so that's what he's asking. Now, we got like the Boston Tea Party in 1773, but um, I don't know if that's... I mean, we do have it in other other, other lines. We have 1773 marked. Now, you know, the, the thing is with the Mayflower, like we have April 5th there. I mean, there might be a line just where that symbol becomes relevant. Um, but I don't know if the sending of the Mayflower back is is a formalization of the message. I have to think about that. So, so this is all about the earth helping the woman. Now, we know that it's going to be France that, that takes the Pope captive. You know, it's not the United States. But the United States rises at that time in 1798. So, I mean... Americans, of course, mark, you know, 1776. But there's a period of time from the American Revolution in which they actually become recognized as a separate country. And my understanding is that's when they, uh, you know, that, well, that's what Ellen White marks, but it, there's stuff dealing with their, uh, their, their fleet and different things like that, wars that they get involved in. There's a lot of history in there. I don't know if I'm, I'm completely satisfied with this, <clears throat> but I think it's a little bit better as far as sticking to the text. Well, here's here's another thing that's kind of intriguing. Now, the date of November 9th, that's a Julian date, correct? Yeah, it's a Julian date. The, time- the reason Julian is because the Brits and and the Americans have not changed from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar at that point even though much of Europe has. Okay. But what I was looking at in this situation, between November 9th and April 5th, Mm -hmm. you have a span of 147 days. Okay. 147 years was the number of years of Jacob's life. Yeah. Three times 49. Or seven times twenty-one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, this brings us up to. So we have the Earth helping the woman, right? Just because we're saying that they're hoping with a little help, and that that is referring to the New World, right? Okay. The Earth helping the woman. So that, that's why we have that, and that's going to be. And then it says, "They that understand among the people." shall instruct many that they shall fall by the sword. Did it take did it did it take the Mayflower to go back what thirty days? That's correct. They they arrived in less than half the time in England from of the time that it took them to sail to America. Yeah, that's just because of the, the prevailing winds. Okay. So so he says, now when they f- shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. And, and this is, they're going to have these four, these four things that are marked, uh, during the, the period of the 1260, right? As we noted, the sword, the flame, the captivity, and the spoil. 
many days, so 1260 years. So we're saying that that is, is this period of persecution that happens during the 1260. There's four different things that are marked. And it says now when they shall fall. So once the persecution, you know, they're in that period of the persecution, they shall be hoping with a little help. So that's the earth helping the woman, Revelation 12, 16. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So that we haven't particularly um, addressed. And then, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them and make them white. So that's the time of the end with the three angels' messages, 1798 to 1844. Right? So even at the time of the end because it is yet for an appointed time. So that's October 22nd, 1844. So to me, we would have to then address, uh, but many shall cleave to them with flattery. So we can just put, the earth helps the woman. I mean, I don't have problems with that being the Mayflower. I'm not sure if I'd put the April 5th date in here. I think it's an interesting date, and definitely it would be in some line, but not necessarily in this line. Because I don't particularly see how that would be a formalization. So we'd have to figure out what the many shall cleave to them with flatteries is about. Like, how would we look at that as a way mark? And and so we got the many, the they, and so how does it go again? So they're going to be helped with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So we have some many are going to cleave and that cleave 3867 that is to twine. So this um, lava to be joined, to join oneself, to borrow, to cause, to borrow, to lend. It also means to borrow. So it must have to do with some kind of an agreement. Look at this word. I can think of some places where cleave occurs in the Bible. Genesis 29, 34. She conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. That word joined is cleave. So you can see it's Levites are joined. Oh, not Sharon. I didn't hit the button. Okay, so 3868. There we go. So 3867 to twine. That's strong. And then we have, so the only time it's translated as cleave is in Daniel 1134. It's often translated as borrow and lend. So would there be some kind of joining that we can mark? They shall cleave to them with flatteries that we can mark that is an event. And this flatteries, um, you know, 2519. It's just one short of 2520. Kala, kalaka. It's quite a word. Kind of interesting. It's actually just a reduplication of another word. In Strong's 2505 is the same word. So he has that number twice in the same word just because of its form. Kalak. And that word to divide is kind of weird. So it means something different. It's in 1121. So, so this word here for flatteries is different than the other word for flatteries. So we have 2514. Yeah, just a different form of the same word. Okay, so, so many is going to cleave to them. Now, why to them? Why not to him in verse 34? Why is it cleaving to them with flatteries? It's a feminine plural noun. <clears throat> so the feminine is just the ending of the quote. Bahala kelechot. Kelechot. It's quite the word. Bahala Hmm. 
You're right. That is interesting that two different words are being translated as flatteries, especially when the second one that you're looking at right now is translated in the earlier portions of scripture as slippery. Right. Which is, is the basic word of what flattery is there. It's a type of slipperiness. You know, sort of like a smooth tongue or a slippery tongue, right? Well, I mean, again, in Daniel, it occurred earlier in 1121 mm-hmm. and being tied to the vile person. Yep. That's how he, you know, which we looked at before, being um, Tiberius and Trump. But the idea, you know, of cleaving or joining with something that's slippery, too, is kind of an interesting idea. They shall cleave to them with slipperiness. So it would show that, you know, there's going to be some that are going to be persecuted. They're going to be helped because the earth is going to help the woman. But many, so it doesn't tell us who particularly these are. I would assume that they're people who, you know, could either flee to the promised land, could, you know, the United States, could go into the wilderness, but they're going to be deceived in some way by the papacy. But it says cleave to them with flatteries. Now, so the fact that it says them, though, is the thing that kind of bothers me, because this is, this, I think, would actually mean the them that they're going to cleave to would have to be the ones that are actually being persecuted, or at least that the earth is helping. So could this have something to do with You know, there's people that go to the U.S., right, some to avoid persecution, right, to flee the ire of the dragon. But the people that are there are going to, you know, provide a temptation for them, right? So we have the rise of the United States. And in the rise of the United States, you're going to have this constitutions, all these different things. And then we're so we have Protestant America. So when we get to verse 35, and of some, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them to purge, to make them white. We know that that's going to be the testing time of the Millerite period. So, so I think there must be something in there about the rise of Protestantism and that this help, I think it can be connected to the constitution, but there's also this worldliness that's there as well. And that's what's hindering the church. That's why the church needs to go through the first, second, and third angels' messages. Anyway, we're going to stop there. I know this is a painful study, but uh, I do think we're getting somewhere. Okay, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day. We ask for a blessing upon the rest of the day and that we can come together tomorrow to tie up some of these ideas that we can see clearly what it is we're looking at. And I pray for each person. May your angels watch over them. May you protect our families. And uh, may we represent you. Thank you again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.